Hello, beautiful listeners. It's your host, Tembi Locke. Welcome to Lifted, a podcast that pulls back the curtain on creativity, resilience, and the extraordinary moments when everything changes. Nzinga Stewart is an NAACP Image Award-nominated director. A graduate of NYU, she started her career in music videos, shooting for artists like Common, Eve, Jay-Z, and 50 Cent, before going on to a successful career as a commercial director. She then transitioned to film and television, where her work includes the Emmy-nominated limited series Inventing Anna, Maid, and Little Fires Everywhere, as well as Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder, and Netflix's Tall Girl. She is the producing director and co-executive producer on From Scratch. Nzinga is someone who I admire deeply for her vision, her sublime creative sensibilities, and her leadership as a female producer. And of course, for her big heart. There is no one you'd rather have dinner with than Nzinga. She will make you try everything on the menu and order double desserts. You can see her vision and heart all over the first episode of From Scratch. Hello, Nzinga Stewart, and welcome to the Lifted Podcast. Hello, happy to be here. (laughs) I am so happy to chat with you for this inaugural episode. You are my first guest. I win! (laughs) (laughs) Well, I thought it would be such a joy. So this whole first season, I'm talking to women who are a part of From Scratch in the creative team. And to kick it off with you is like the absolute best because you know how much I adore and admire you. And for our listeners, Nzinga and I met through From Scratch, which is one of the greatest gifts of my life is being able to collaborate and work with you. And so I love the fact that we're going to get a chance to talk today about you and about the things that inspire you, but also a little bit about our show. So I'm very excited. I'm excited to talk about our show, about all the other things as well, but we've been pregnant for so long with it that I'm really excited to talk to you. I'm going to start with a kind of early formative question because I really love learning about people's childhoods. And what I mean by that is that sort of early formative experience when you first knew, oh, I move through the world with a creative bent. I see the world maybe differently than other folks. That sort of artistic inkling. Did you have that early on in your childhood? Was that something you were aware of? Was it encouraged, cultivated? I had it early on in my childhood. I just didn't know it. I didn't know that it was different from maybe the way any other kid was. And maybe it wasn't. It just was my way. But I have tapes my mom made of me talking to imaginary people and animals and creating these huge stories for everybody from I was like four. By the time I was like eight or nine, I was writing these little plays, little religious plays, because I was very religious as a child and was the only kid in my family who was like that, but was very seriously religious. I would make my brothers and my cousins act in. So we still have pictures of like these plays I did for the family where I was the art director and the costume designer and the director. Okay. What I love by that is you inducted everyone in your household into this vision, (laughs) meaning that they, you know, because they're people, kids who probably did that, but like maybe everyone around them wasn't game to join in. And I think (laughs) that imprint early on of being able to induct others into the world that you've created must have been so instructive. It's one of those things where the parents were like, that's her time to do something like you all are going to be in it. (laughs) You all have your time where she's got to play with you guys. Like now it's her time. You have to be in it. It It's kind of forced labor. (laughs) (laughs) I know that your early career path began in music videos. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that and then maybe that pivot to wanting to and then pursuing scripted television? I did know that I wanted to direct music videos by the time I went to college. I loved music videos so much, but it was not easy to sort of figure out how to get into it. I would put flyers all over NYU saying I could have access to film equipment. I would do it for free if somebody gave me a shot. I wrote letters to every record label and got internships at different record labels, trying to meet people, which I did meet people. And then when people did start calling for the flyers, like it was allegedly drug dealers who wanted to rap and like had cash. So 
I did a lot of want to be the next Jay Z videos, and then I I did from the internships get to work with other directors, and I said, you know, I write too, so I would write their treatments, and they would be like, well, how do I execute this because it's in your head, and I would work on it with them. I didn't know then I was co-directing, and then a couple of the directors that I was working for and writing with. Finally, would tell other people at labels she's really smart, she's really good, she's put together a reel on these street hustler videos, <laughs> and, and I did get a rep, and I did get to start directing like real music videos where that street hustler stuff came in handy with like a fifty cent <laughs> and a Noriega, and I got to start from that doing more and more work. There's so much I hear in this sort of upstart into your career because the first thing that strikes me is you are a woman in a male world, right? If it you're was talking very to me much about, that. Right. And so right away, what the question that comes to me is, what was that like as a young woman? First of all, the chutzpah, the tenacity, the sort of forethought of like, I am writing letters to labels. I am going <laughs> to put up the flyers. And then the willingness of whoever comes, I'm going to answer the call, meaning even if it's an alleged, as you say, drug allegedly. Dealer. allegedly, allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, allegedly, right? But as a young woman, was that ever an issue? Were you finding your voice or did that help you very quickly be able to say, I own the, the ground that I stand on. This is my point of view. Let's roll with it. Let's go. Did it give you a confidence? Funny enough, it gives me a confidence now because starting out that way, when there are real stakes to work not being good, like these people are not living fully legal lives and abiding by all the laws of our land. So you're afraid to mess up with their money and you're afraid to not do a great job. I am not interested in a job unless it makes me a little bit nervous anymore. Like that is the thing that is exciting and makes you want to take on a project. So you are a little bit nervous walking into things, but I can always counteract and be like, well, if it doesn't work out, nobody's going to kill me. <laughs> Like it'll be, it may be mad, but I'll make it through this a lot. So it gave me confidence in that sense. And back then it really was male dominated. Like there were like three of us possibly in the world who got their work on MTV or on BET. Interestingly enough, starting out in hip hop, it's very different working with rappers than it is working with, say, in the male dominated world of white Hollywood. I sometimes realize that those artists were often raised by single moms. They were raised by women and women who like figured out the budget. Everybody ate whether or not they had a lot of money or not. Everybody got to school on time. And so they sort of took it for granted that I knew what I was doing. Everything wasn't a test. It just felt like, all right, you want me to stand over there? I'll stand over there. If somebody else didn't want to, they would fight with them. Like she told us to stand over here. <laughs> Like there was definitely a trust that I found working sometimes with men when I got to Hollywood. It was different. It, I, I wouldn't have expected it to be that way, but there was often a lot more work involved in proving myself in a way that that wasn't there when I worked with women. It wasn't there when I worked with hip hop artists. There is a trust there. Thank you for sharing that because that I think is a point of view that many people might not think of. And that is a distinction, and particularly around men who were raised by single moms and black and brown men who've been raised by single moms who know that the women in our lives will get it done. What is the role of art in your work? And what I mean by that is how art ignites your soul, your sense of vision or possibility. Like, is that how you decide what you're going to take on? Two things when I take on a project. I know I can do a great job. And like, I absolutely don't know I can do a great job. <laughs> it has to be both at the same time. I think if there's work now, like I've really moved out of, we're going to show up in a courtroom and shoot this every day. We're going to show up at the hospital or the police precinct, like that sort of work, because I absolutely know I can do it and nail it. There is no fear. There is no concern that I can't do it. It's not challenging. It's like when you're in school and like you've passed that material. And so you start acting up <laughs> because it's not challenging anymore. But I also don't take work that I don't feel like there's a possibility that I could nail it. And usually that will start from, this is something that I can do very well visually, because that is the art form that coming from music videos, there's not people talking to each other and actors. It's how can you create something that just on a base level looks cool 
and that has a certain taste level. So I know I can do that. And so it has to be something that there's a visual element that I can get really excited about. It can't just be, again, like we're all in a hospital. Like that won't be exciting for me. Does play inform your life and does it inform your work? I think there's two forms of play. There's like an ease that you can bring to set that a lot of times, like I like to keep a loose village. I will have my dance parties. They have increased (laughs) because I do think the actors pick up on when there's a tension or an anxiety in the air. I think the crew, there's times a day where everybody starts to lag. We're just tired. And I felt like I know what this scene needs. It needs music. And of course, like the ADs and the producers don't want to hear that when the the clock is ticking. (laughs) And I was like, we have to stop everything. We got to put on some music. (laughs) We played Yeah by Usher and Little John and had like a two minute dance party and then went into the scene right after that. And everybody woke up because there was just a permission to play and to have a good time and to dance. And they saw me dancing and knew like, oh, all of us have permission to like let go. And then there's play in your art where you try things that may not work out. That's just fun. Like an example of just sometimes when I'm working with a really great actor, I will give them a note that's probably more fun for me than for them. It's like getting a new car and like, I wonder if it can go this fast, (laughs) like that I just want to see if they can do it. And it's just fun. And it wakes up a scene sometimes, even if it wasn't the right direction. I just wanted to see what would happen if we threw that in there. Every once in a while when the pressure is on, I forget that. It's always a scene where I forget that, that that is a tool, that play is a tool at my disposal, where I later on regret it and feel like, I wish I'd remembered that. It sounds to me, actually, I know this from working with you. I've seen you do this. You are someone who follows your intuition a great deal. And I've seen you actually stop like on a dime and be like, something doesn't feel right. And you need a minute and you drop into something. (laughs) I don't know what it is. And then you're willing to go left, even if everyone else is going right. Is that something that you have cultivated with intentionality? Is it just something you've happened upon? What is your relationship to your intuition, both in life and in work? I am a person who tends to learn things the hard way. And I have never learned easily when it comes to my work or to my personal life, I often will have to repeat a thing until I really get it like, oh, don't do that. But when I learn it, I'm positive. Sometimes I'm strong and wrong, but I'm positive not to do anything else because I have finally gotten it. For example, with work, I will know if I don't have a scene and I will feel the producers and I will feel the ADs and then the line producer comes over and it's just like a giant budget clock ticking behind me. And I just know when they're saying, you got it, it's there. I know when I can say, I promise you, I don't have it. We will regret this later on in the edit room if I don't go again. Because I know enough that once a lesson has been learned, I have to trust myself. And if my intuition is like really an alarm bell saying you don't have it or saying you've got it, that now I really listen to myself and in my personal life as well, where if it's something that like, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know not to do this, nothing will make me do it because I know this is going to somehow turn out to be another time I have to learn this lesson in a painful way. I definitely believe in what I call spiral learning. <laughs> like sometimes I'm going down <laughs> on the spiral, but I'm, I'm a learning spiral something learner. in order to go up. You know, I've got to circle down and I've got to repeat that thing and then I'll go up again. And I think if we trust that about ourselves, and for me, it's the learning not to judge myself when I feel like I'm, okay, I'm revisiting the same pattern again. Oh, 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 okay. So let me trust that I'm meeting it at a different place. I'm a little more elevated, a little wiser. I'll learn something. And even if I have to circle back to it again, the lag time between it happening and me learning from it is shorter. Like it gets shorter every time. Yeah, And that's a value. (laughs) Some of it is getting older. Some of it is getting wiser and trusting, you know, your intuition. Because this podcast is called Lifted. (laughs) One of the things that I'm really curious about, especially with the wonderful, beautiful women in my life who are closest to me and with whom I admire so much is like, what or whom has lifted you most in your life, would you say? 
I will say two things. One is music that I will often put on like whatever music I think a situation calls for. <laughs> if I'm particularly afraid of something, I'll put on gospel music. If it feels like the vibe isn't right, I'll put on like some Bob Marley music. <laughs> If I feel like afraid going into a situation, I'll put on like some biggie and like amp myself up. And also when I feel sort of lost, gratitude lifts me. Every time I remember, what are you grateful for in this moment? I do get a certain energy that like everything can feel lost. And then I'll just remember, well, this problem you're having now is because a prayer was answered. And, and so now you're in a situation to have this big problem because a prayer was answered, like be grateful for that. And that will lift me. I love that answer. And I am reminded of something you said early on, you wrote these religious plays when you were a child, right? And you talked about having a prayer that's answered. And now it's like, oh, <laughs> There's an obstacle, but it's the result of something I asked for that I received. And I remember being on set with you. I would see the things that weren't in flow. I would turn to you and invariably what you would say is, I worship a God of yes and. Somehow we will find a way. It's not an either or, it's a yes and. And that was a shift for me. Talk about something that lifted me in those moments when you would say that. I'd be like, okay, hold on. Here's a reframing. Yes, there is this obstacle, but there's a yes and. So, okay, that's happening. But also- how can we work with it? That was a really wonderful pivot. So I thank you for that. Well, that came from a good girlfriend of mine who who would say that in situations that she should have been making choices. <laughs> she would we'd be at an expensive restaurant and she would be like, lobster or steak? Honey, I serve a God of Anne. And I'm like, God does not need to spend a $500 on dinner. <laughs> what? Somehow it still was always fine at the end of the day. And I absorbed that lesson that like, it doesn't have to be either or. We serve a God of and who can be like, you can have both things. You can have everything. And that is a possibility that I don't know that women often give themselves a grace of considering, oh, I, I can actually have all these things that I want at the same time. And that'll be okay. <laughs> Especially Black women and women of yeah. color. Our mothers didn't model that for us because the opportunities were closed to them or it felt, you know, too much. So I definitely like that was a gift to me. And sometimes I'm in a situation whenever I feel really like limited and I find myself in a limited mindset, I try to reframe and say, okay, what is the possibility here? Because possibility is always sitting right by side your perceived limitation. It doesn't mean everything will happen, but at least opening yourself up to the possibility that there is possibility here shifts something. Yeah. Yeah. I also think we're used to, we have to make choices is what we've sort of, like you said, what we've learned from our mothers and our circumstances and our family structures. We've already told ourselves, I have to choose when it's like, no, you actually can have lobster and steak. It's called surf and turf. That meal exists. <laughs> like, so. But it can happen. <laughs> yes, it, it does exist. And we have already told ourselves no. Would you say that spirituality or religion plays a role in your life today in terms of how you move through the world? Absolutely. Not so much religion. So I stopped being religious around age 10 because I felt like before then I loved Jesus so much. <laughs> Like, it was just, I was changing the words to songs on the radio to make them gospel songs. And then when Thriller came out, I loved Michael Jackson so much that I felt like there can only be one. Like, I can't love two things this much. And so I stopped being religious and just fully devoted myself to Michael Jackson. And now I've gotten to a place where, like, religion... I do respect and think it's so important for some people. My husband is Muslim and is a devout Muslim and does all of the things that you do. Doesn't eat pork, doesn't drink alcohol, does Ramadan. And that structure is such a sacred space for him that whenever he's feeling sort of in a spiral anywhere in the world, if he goes to mosque, he feels recentered. And I remember in episode two, 
there was a scene where Amy takes Lino to the sports bar to see soccer because she remembers like that is something that in his part of the world he would do. And it recenters him because it's something that's familiar and of home to him. And I had such a similar experience with my husband when he moved from Morocco to the United States. Then he was having just a rough time adjusting and felt lost and I had all my friends and support and he was alone in this very different world that one day we were driving and he, I told him I wasn't going to tell him where we were going. It was a surprise. And we pulled up to a mosque and he practically ran out the car. Again, I'm not religious, so I stayed in the car. And then when he came out, like he was just, you could feel like so much energy and light and joy. Like he was filled to the brim with joy because he tapped into this place that felt so familiar and he got to pray in his language and hear an imam speak that I do know religion can really lift people. My path has been one more outside of a structured religion, but reading the Bible will often calm me or make me feel hopeful or like safe and grounded. So will reading the teachings of Buddha. Like I don't know what day calls for what, but it is just a centering force in this in this business. And I think there's such a sometimes a chasm between doing what you think of as art, which is fun and which is the thing you love and you wake up to do. And then like a business that is not always fun to be in where you have to do that. And like spirituality will be the thing that's like, this will be my consistent touchstone that I can go meditate or I can go pray or I can go read something or listen to gospel music and like calm myself and like remember who I am, what I care about when I'm doing the thing I love in an industry that I don't always love. Thank you so much for that share, because what I got from that is this sense of in the story you shared about your husband and driving him to the mosque, that that joy, that uplift that he got was for two reasons. One, the person he loves the most saw him and knew and intuited what was needed. I'm a firm believer that whenever we feel seen for our pain or our joy, for our vulnerabilities, the places that we are uneven and crooked (laughs) and even sometimes broken, when we feel seen, it lifts us, right? So you saw him, you saw the need. And then You took him to a place that is fundamentally a space that grounds him and that hooks him into something bigger. So that combo platter had to have like lit him up. I often think about when we see someone else, we lift them. Just like I know in times when I've been seen, it lifts me, right? I go, okay, ooh, because maybe I've forgotten who I am or I've forgotten what I need and it takes someone outside of me to witness even one small part of me and acknowledge it and then maybe offer something that I could use in that moment. I'm blind to, or I I don't quite see if there's a veil of some sort. And that's what love is. And I know our series is a lot about all the different iterations of love. Your share was about the romantic love, but it was also about the love of spirit, the love of the creative spirit in terms of the creator, whether you assign that as God or Allah or Buddha, whomever that is for you. I know Attic and I, with great intentionality before you came aboard, we knew that this series was about the arc of love across a lifetime and that arc of love from Eros, which is that romantic, hot, flashy, oh, I just got to be next to him kind of love or her, whomever your erotic love is, you know, with all the way through to this larger agape love, which is the love that is bigger than borders, language, culture, bigger than race bigger than all of that, right? It is just that love of the one of the unity. And so when you came into our lives, oh my gosh, I remember when you walked into the room the first time, I was like, oh, who is this beautiful woman? (laughs) And then you sat down and you set forth a visual vision for what the show might be. And you lifted it. Literally, we had it and it was in my head clearly because I lived it, you know? But now bringing your beautiful creativity was taking it to this new place. When this project first landed in your lap, what was your first like gut reaction? When I first read this book, I wept for hours. I thought it was so incredibly beautiful. I have told you this before, but I am like a possum. <laughs> like when I'm either afraid or there's too much emotion, like I just go to sleep. <laughs> and so when I read that book, I slept for, it was a weekend and I slept for something like 12 hours. <laughs> because it was so much emotion for my body to just 
pass it through that like I just cried and cried and then I guess fell asleep and like slept for hours. I feel like I was so excited and honored to even talk to you after reading the book and feeling like this is the person that not only lived this, but took such care with her own story to tell us the truth about everything. It sort of passed that test that I was saying, like it scared me and I felt like I could do a good job. And I felt like, how can you not do a good job in Italy <laughs> and shooting food, you know, and with these words, like there was so much in it that excited me right off the bat. But I think it always comes back to as a director, who are the two human beings or who is the human being at the center of the story? And if they're a well-rounded character that I can go on a journey with, then it's something that I'm going to get excited about. This was a story where nobody was the same way throughout and everybody had different dimensions. And like you said, it was different kinds of love. So it knocked me out, the story. You were very clear early on with this pilot that not only were we bringing the audience into this world that we're creating and we're starting this journey, right? This is the moment that you're going to meet this character at an inflection point in her life where everything that happens in this pilot is going to forever change the course of her life. We all knew that. But also something in the pilot, we're about to go on, which is essentially like a, almost a, four, it's a 14 year journey with this character. So you talk about choosing material wherein you know that there's going to be these ups and downs and dimensions falling in love with the world and the two people at the center of this world in this first episode is essential because you got to be with them through all of these iterations. Was there a scene in the pilot that you were like, I really feel like if we have this, the audience is with us? Or was there something else about the pilot that you thought, if I bring this to the pilot, I will feel good and I know it will also lift the show? I knew that the scene in the restaurant had to work. And I felt like it wasn't a scene about dialogue. The two scenes in the restaurant I knew had to work and had to anchor the show because there were so many metaphors in the book and in the script. Every episode is titled something to do with food. Everything in the scripts, every episode started with a quote from Sicily that's, you know, oftentimes involved food. It was his passion. And because we're in Amy's point of view, we're telling this story about her beloved. So what is most important to him? And it's food. What he literally brought to the table in the relationship. He felt like, I don't have money. I'm not rich like this guy or fancy like this guy. What I have is this gift I've been given and I can share it with her. So I knew those two scenes had to work. The first one had to show, strangely, eroticism. Like it had to feel like she was being made love to as this food was presented to her. And the second one had to show a family love because that's where we were going from the arrows to the agape. Those are sort of our bookends. Seeing like the family dynamic that her family showed up for her, that they were protective of her, that they were funny, was really like everything that our show needed to have. It's an invitation to lean in. That's what I take from them. And I hope that viewers, when they watch it, they see like, lean into the good stuff. Lean into the stuff that like lights you up and excites you. You know, it, it means so much, right? We have to do that. Well, there's a visual language that we start the restaurant scenes with that is different than the rest of the show that just sort of is like, dive into this juicy moment. And so often... When there's not dialogue in a scene, they will be the first things to get cut. But so often what is important can't be said. And so it had to have a visual language that was strong enough and almost iconic to the series that feels like this only exists on our show, <laughs> this visual language when it comes to romance. It's again, going back to that intuition that you know what it needs. And in the making of it, you'll say, we need to be closer. In the making of it, you'll feel like we should put on some music. That'll help our operator understand what this scene is. You'll understand these things in the making of it. So you go in with the plan, but then your gut tells you, go deeper, go closer, make them do it again. <laughs> Explain a little bit more the importance of this scene. Go talk to this one or that one privately. Let them know what this is really about. Where again, your gut just says, you either don't have it yet or you've got to go deeper to get it. I think the series is also 
what it was. And it is something that I'm so honored to have been a part of and something that I love so much. And I can say that immodestly and not feel like I have any part in taking like credit for it because there was something invisible behind the scenes. Like there was so much love that it was grounded in before actors got on set, before I ever read it. That was just baked in. I remember you said something to me in Sicily, and I feel like it's almost what what I'm trying to say now is when we were at the church and I said, I feel like crying when I'm in that church, you said the churches in Sicily were always places that were sanctified that in America, like a church can be a a Walmart the next day. Like if it's not working, another gas station will be there. But in Sicily, this would have been a basilica before that. It would have been a mosque before that. It would have been an Orthodox church before that. Like that this ground has always been sacred. Somebody knew there's something here before even the stones were laid that no matter which religion comes in, it will stay in that spot. And that's how I feel about this series. Like that love is so central and such a basic thing that no matter who comes to it, it finds its way up through the work. Thank you. I completely agree. And I feel like that's the gift. You know, when we set out to do this, we didn't know if that would be the case. We hoped. And every day we woke up with our open hearts and best intentions and inviting and inducting everyone into the love that was at the core. And then spirit showed up (laughs) and made it happen. I mean, I can only say it as straightforward as that because there were many days where there was nothing logical about the magic that was happening. It was just an alchemy. I think that comes through on the screen. Do you have in your own life, your own from scratch moment? And what I mean by that is a moment where you find yourself in a place that you didn't expect, where life is asking of you something maybe that you don't think you can do or haven't done before, and you have to begin again or start from where you are? Yes. It happens almost every five years. (laughs) Again, I'm not sure. Whenever change happens in my life, it's usually with a finality. It is usually like, this is no longer happening at all. And it's, you know, with music videos, it happened. And it was just a moment of like, there's not a phasing out. It just is like, that will never happen again. And I love music videos. So it's heartbreaking. But it just like, I just knew one day, like, now that's done. I'll never get another job doing that. But there have been often moments with relationships where In the past, I could let a bad relationship go a long time. (laughs) And then there will just be a point where it just stops for me. And I'll say like, that will never happen again. Like I said to you once a thing in the Bible, when God told Moses, these Egyptians, you will never see again. (laughs) These ones who you had to go through the 10 10 commandments, the the 10 uh, plagues with, you have passed that test. You will never see them again. Not ever. Mm -hmm. And that that does usually come with a mourning and a grieving. There are things deeper than music videos that I'm not mentioning, but they will come with a a mourning period and a sort of closing in on myself to let it pass and to like grow a new shell. And then it's onto something that's totally different. And then there's that like being afraid again (laughs) and like, but we got to do this new thing. We're going to see how that works out. And it happens in my art where it'll be like, and now we're completely done with episodic television. And I've learned so much and I've loved it so much. And I've gotten to work with such great actors and such good episodic TV. But there's a moment where it feels like there's such a specificity and like limited series and features that like I'm being called to this. I don't know if I would be as useful in this other space anymore. Like time to do something else. But it it always comes with a sort of sadness and a like molting in <laughs> before the new thing happens. That resonates a lot. And I'm so glad that you talk about the mourning period. I think a lot of people don't spend enough time honoring that as a stage in the process. They want to jump right to like the next thing. And in owning that that grief that you experience while you said as you grow a new shell. And then the other thing I hear in what you said is. For all of us in our from scratch moments, I know certainly in mine, I write about it is there's a component of curiosity that has to be threaded through that you say, okay, I don't know what this next thing is, but I'm curious to take the journey. 
I'm curious to see what will come. I'm curious to see how my life might be lifted by trying something new. That's what I hear in your share. I think the number one element of a life well lived is curiosity because it is sort of a nudge from your guardian angels, your ancestors, like whoever. It is a nudge that there's something here for you. It can be walking down the street and you see something and think, I wonder how, why that's like that. And then you dig into it. The next project that I'm going to work on is a screenplay that I wrote because I was just curious about these girls who ride motorcycles in Morocco. (laughs) And like, that's so interesting to be like, all these girls here ride motorcycles. (laughs) And then you dig into it and you ask questions and there's whole cultures that girls don't do that. And like all of them do that here. All my nieces did. They're like 16. (laughs) Like. There's always something for you on the other side of curiosity, even if it's not in the moment. Later on, you will have a reason to recall that fact and it will be like a little present. But if you don't go beyond that initial thing, if you don't investigate any further, you miss out on a gift that was meant for you and sent specifically to you. Thank you for that. That is a beautiful, beautiful way to close out this conversation, a gift that was sent to you. I think people will remember that and hold on to that. I know I will, (laughs) as I think (laughs) about the things when, you know, because you're right, when something catches your attention, it's landed for you in your consciousness for a reason. Keep the door open. I loved this conversation with Nzinga, specifically what she says about living a life of curiosity, that there is always something for you on the other side of it, and that if you investigate it, you'll find the gift that was meant for you and sent specifically to you. That makes me feel lifted. Lifted is developed, written, and produced by me and my one-woman producing team, Solia Cates. It is edited by Jamie Moss. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for our next inspiring episode.